John Schmidt, June 17, 1949, Elgin, Illinois. My wife always says it was like uh, Ricky Nelson's life. <laughs> it was it was a good life. We re grew up in a relatively large town. Elgin, Illinois was about 50,000 people and it was nice neighborhoods. Kids could play outside and walk to school and didn't have to lock our doors all the time. Well, I came out to Iowa and went to Iowa State University for a year. And that was during the Vietnam conflict and I really wasn't enjoying school that much. When I dropped out of college, I got drafted and ended up going to service. And then I went to uh, Fort Sam Houston to be a medic. Not by choice, but that's what the Army decided they needed at the time, so you kind of do what they tell you. I was a combat medic. I went out in the field with the infantry unit all the time. As long as six weeks without clean clothes, we'd get resupplied every three to four days and get food and water. And other than that, we slept out in the jungle, in the open, no tents, no sleeping pads, no nothing, just a blanket to roll up in on the ground and live with the snakes and the bugs. Walking through the jungle, going on, on a patrol, and 90% uh, of our work was done as uh, platoon size or company sized units, and we'd go out and it was called search and destroy missions, and you'd try to find the, the enemy and destroy them. As I said, we went one time for six weeks without a change of clothes. Uh, when we were in the field, basically our day was from Sun up in the morning, you'd, you'd eat, you'd break up your camp, and we'd be going through the jungle, cutting a trail through something, because uh, the higher-ups would, would say, all right, we've, we've got enemy activity in this area over here, and you guys got to go over and check that area out, because we think there might be a, a base camp there, or there might be an enemy camp of some kind there. And you might be two miles away, and the only way to get there is to walk. We were fighting against Vietnam. And there was what's called the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down along the side of Vietnam, and that's how the supplies were brought in by the North Vietnamese. We were fighting the North Vietnamese. Well, this trail system was protected because it was in Cambodia. So Nixon decided, that, you know what, if we could just go in there and destroy that supply route, we could stop the North Vietnamese from bringing supplies in and stop the war and turn it over to the South Vietnamese people. And in 1970, that's what we did, and the 1st Cavalry Division was the first American troops to legally go into Cambodia. And it was called the Cambodian Incursion. We called it an invasion. They, they told us we're going in there the 1st of May and at the uh, end of June everybody's coming back out and that's going to be the end of that and then we're going to get out of Vietnam. So that's what we did and that's where I got wounded the second day we went into Cambodia. We went into Cambodia and we secured this area. It was called Firebase Ready. It was in a big clearing. I'd, I'd call it like a, the shape of a football, kind of an oval-shaped clearing, and it was huge. So they brought us in a battalion-sized airlift, which was the first one that they'd ever done. Usually you'd take, we, we, were, we were transported by helicopter all the time. I mean, we'd go into a spot, we'd spend a day there, four days there, six days there, and they'd pick us up and move us into another spot, always trying to find the enemy. Well, this time they said we're taking in the whole battalion all at once, and it was over 49, 50 helicopters all at one time in one lift, which was unheard of. But they were afraid if they brought small groups in, we'd get wiped out before we got done. So they brought us all into this great big clearing that we could all land all these helicopters at once. And while we were digging in the first night, trying to secure a place where we could sleep, uh, we got attacked with a ground attack from... Right over here by the woods, it was only about 40 yards away from the trees. One, of the, one or two of our guys were still digging their hole, and they looked up, and here was North Vietnamese coming right at us. And then they opened up with machine guns from two different sides and cut us pinned down, and we were stuck there. And we did have artillery guys in, so we immediately started fighting back, and then the artillery started shooting artillery right where they were coming from, and they shot what's called direct fire with... Uh, they call them flechette rounds, but it's like it's like shotguns. You know, a lot of a lot of little bullets going out all at once, and they're just exploding and trying to get as many as you can. And uh, we spent that entire night on 100% alert, uh, 
choppers and, and bombers never stop the entire night bombing the wood line right around our base and stuff. And we lost two guys, but that was all. The next morning, we were trying to get organized and figure out what the day was going to bring us. And some guys from the artillery battery, which had been firing all night long, they had so many empty shells. And you know what? A canister would be probably, you shot a, a gun or a rifle, you know what the shell casing looks like that's left over. Well, artillery has the same thing, only it's that long and that big around. Well, after firing a few hundred of them, they got enough stuff in there, they can't hardly walk around. It's like trying to walk over the top of marbles. So they got the pickup truck and they said, okay, we're going to go out and clean this up, throw them all in the back of the pickup truck and go and dump them in the wood line. And they did it without having anybody else know it. And they drove out to the wood line and snipers opened up on them and two guys out there happened to be right in front of our section. So we had to take off and go out and get these guys. They were pinned down out there. Time we got out there, one of them was dead, and we drug them both back into the base. And as soon as we got out there and came, started our way back in, then the artillery started firing right over our heads again with high explosive. They were shooting right in the tops of the trees because wherever it hits, it's going to explode and it's going to pan out all around. So we got back in, got the guys to the station, ran, jumped in our bunker. More or less, it was just a foxhole, and. I got it from an artillery round, from our own, one of our own artillery rounds. It didn't knock me out, but it, it's like hitting your crazy bone. I got hit right here in the neck, and I just tingled all over. I mean, it was like, bing, bing. <laughs> and uh, finally, I, I put my hand up like that, and I looked, and oh man, I'm bleeding. And the guy that was sitting next to me happened to look, and Doc, you're hit. And he jumped up, started hollering for a medic. He said, hey, you're the medic. <laughs> Well, there were more medics on the base, so they got, the, got a medic to come over. They got them to stop firing artillery and got the medic to come over and uh, got me all bandaged up as much as they could. And at that time, I could feel my right side, but I couldn't feel much on my left side at all. But I never lost consciousness, and so they started calling for a medevac plane or a medevac chopper to come and pick me up. And sadly, there weren't any medevacs around. They were all being out on missions in the other direction and they said well, we can't get a medevac to, into, to you guys for several hours at the, at the very soonest. And they said well we don't think we got several hours. They had two guys that were in body bags already and they thought I'd probably be the third. And uh, the battalion commander happened to be in his chopper flying around up overhead to see what was going on and what had transpired the day before. And his pilot called down and said hey I'm right up above you guys. If you need a medevac that bad, I'll come down and boot him off and we'll take whoever it is back to the hospital. So that's what they did. They dropped down there and kicked out. He was a, he was a colonel. Kicked him off of the helicopter. The next morning after the surgery, the, the doctor came out and he said, well, John, I got some good news for you and I got some bad news for you. And I said, well, what's the good news? He said, well, you get to go home. He said, the bad news is you might not get to use your left arm anymore. I had three nerves that were severed, two of them severed and one was damaged in my neck right here where it comes out of your spinal column and controls your left arm and he said your leg's okay but your arm we don't know if it'll get any, any better. And it has some better over the years but then as you get older it gets worse again and then they also found out 20 years later that my diaphragm on the left side was paralyzed and so my left lung is only about a quarter of the size of my right lung. Being wounded, when I was evacuated, I didn't get anybody's names and phone numbers or anything like that because it's an emergency. And so when we left, basically they didn't know if I was alive or if I was dead. And I didn't know what happened to the rest of those guys until many, many years later, I finally found my, uh, my platoon leader, my lieutenant, and he kind of enlightened me as to what happened. But we went for 36 years and never talked to the guys I was in the service with. And then because of the internet and the availability of information, uh, we started, I started checking, you know, trying to get a hold of guys, put my name on the first Cavs website and they had a, you know, a, a page where you could be a guest, you know, guest book and make inquiries and stuff. And after 36 years, about two weeks of doing that, and I'd tried different times and never got any hits on it. 
All of a sudden, I got an email from a guy that said, I think I might know you. And so we emailed back and forth a few times and turned out he was the guy that was sitting right next to me in Foxhole when I got hit. And then about a week after that, another guy sent an email. He said, I think I might know you. I think you might have been my medic. So the three of us got to email him back and forth. And finally, after about two weeks of doing that, one of us had the nerve to pick up the telephone and actually call the guy. And we started talking and thought, you know what? There's three of us who have found each other now. We ought to see if we can't find a few more guys. And we started brainstorming and searching on the Internet and every place we could and ended up finding about 20 guys that were in our platoon. Now, a platoon is usually about 30 guys. And we had found about 20. And I said, man, this is pretty good. You know, we ought to get together someplace and have a reunion. Well, it, it was really hard to do after not knowing these guys for 36 years and always wondering where they went or what happened to them, who lived and who didn't, we said, yeah, let's do it. So we made arrangements down in Nashville, Tennessee, because a lot of them were Southern boys, and uh, we decided to have a reunion. And there was 30, 30 guys and their wives and significant others came to the reunion. And uh, it still chokes me up because <clears throat> We didn't realize how much we loved each other, and it took that long to get back together and, and finally reacquaint it. And it was really very moving for most everybody. There were probably more tears shed in two days than I'd ever imagined. You know, and, and the nice thing about it was our wives got to know each other and found out that we all had the same kind of problems. When you talk about uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, pretty hard to go through a a war zone without having some PTSD and surprisingly we all kind of had the same reactions we all kind of had the same stories to tell so our lives were impacted so much that from that day forward we were going through the same kind of experiences and suffering through the same kind of problems and because of it we've we've now got uh, over 400 guys in our reunion list that were all in our company at the same time from 1965 to 1972 and one guy knew another guy that was there when he was there, and we get to find him. And so we've got over 400 names on our on our list, and uh, it's really been gratifying. And we have reunions every year, probably two or three sometimes in a year, in different locations where guys get together and reconnect, and and we share a lot of lot of stories about how we're dealing with things now, but also how to deal with things. We've you know got guys uh, enrolled in the VA so they can get their uh, their care the way they're supposed to, to get disability and compensation that they should have been getting for 30 years and never got, and now they're finding out, hey, I can, I'm, I'm eligible for that, and I'm supposed to get it, so why shouldn't I? So uh, it was just a real gratifying thing to finally get back together with them. You get to know people way better. You understand their fears. They trust you for their life, with their life, and I trusted them with my life. We depended on each other. 100%. There was no such thing. And, and I, from my experience, and I, just because I was a medic, there were a lot of things that I didn't have to do, like pulling guard duty or carrying as much ammo or things like that. They thought I was God because I was the nearest thing they had to a doctor. If one of them was wounded, I had to get up and go take care of them right now. It didn't make any difference if there were bullets flying or bombs going off around us. You had to get up and go through that jungle and go get to them and try and do what you could to save their life. Because of that, they loved me, and I didn't have enough. Like I said, that's where our training didn't, didn't do enough. I've got friends that I went to school with that I grew up with, and I don't know as much about some of them as I did them guys in Vietnam in five months. I guess just to appreciate life. When you come close to losing it and you see guys that lose it, uh, it makes you cherish it a lot more, and then you come to the realization, you know, that Unlike a lot of the, the problems we have in the country today, there, you become a lot more patriotic because you've suffered and some of your friends have suffered. And when that happens, you kind of have a different appreciation for things.